I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. I'd like to welcome you all here to the Manhattan Institute's 25th annual Walter B. Wriston Lecture. Uh, and, and it's named for Walter Wriston because Walter Wriston was a true believer in ideas. And in this room over the past 25 years, we've discussed many ideas that have made a big difference in the lives of the people of this city and of this nation. And I think our speaker tonight, uh, Neil Ferguson, is a worthy successor in that tradition. And we're, we're very pleased to have him here and very excited to uh, hear his presentation. Uh, I encourage you to just enjoy your meal with your, with your comrades at your table. And we will start our formal program in about an hour. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. On behalf of all of the Institute's trustees, scholars, and staff, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 25th Annual Wriston Lecture. <laughs> the list of honorees, including Justices Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, and Antonin Scalia, columnists Charles Krauthammer and George Will, and social thinkers like Leon Cass, George Weigel, and Robbie George, have informed and enriched our intellectual debate on the urgent issues of our time. This year's honoree, Neil Ferguson, easily fits into their company. Before turning my attention to Neil, let me say a brief word about the Wriston Lecture and the Manhattan Institute. Walter Wriston, for whom this lecture is named, was a man of enormous talents, a banker, author, and government advisor, as well as a World War II veteran and recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Walter Wriston believed in America, and he believed in the power of ideas to shape the course of human events. Just one example. One of Mr. Wriston's books, Risk and Other Four-Letter Words, reads like, a man, like the man himself, a sparkling combination of strong reasoned convictions, wit, and eloquence. Let me read you the first paragraph of the book. Every good thing in the world stands on the razor edge of danger, wrote Thornton Wilder. He was right. The clear lesson of history is that individual liberty, the basic underpinning of American society, requires constant defense against the encroachment of the state. A free society, if it is to remain free, requires citizens who take the risk of standing up to be counted on the issues of the day. One can only imagine what Walter Wriston would have thought about the Occupy Wall Street movement. <laughs> a collection, at least in large measure, of big government anarchists, a particularly noxious combination, <laughs> aging hippies, anti-capitalists and anti-Semites, and of people desperately in need of putty training. These are the kinds of movements in some th that sometimes arise in free societies that are facing difficult times. Social divisions deepen, resentments rise to the surface, and people begin or begin to take to the streets. I should add that it doesn't help when the only in individual who represents all the people in America, the President of the United States, makes a conscious decision to inflame passions, turn citizen against citizen, and to demonize the most productive members of society. But that is where we find ourselves in this disquieting time. And that is where the Manhattan Institute comes in. It is, to paraphrase Wriston's words, producing scholars who take the risk of standing up to be counted on the issues of the day. And it is making a profoundly positive difference. Take one of our newest hires, Josh Barrow,
who is our Wriston Fellow. Josh, at a relatively young age, has quickly become one of the nation's most respected voices on fiscal policy. Recently, Josh has focused attention on the enormous unfunded liabilities at the state and local level. He's produced a number of path-breaking reports on the need for public employee, employee pension and health benefit reforms. And he spent a good deal of the year traveling across the country to discuss these reforms in various state capitals. He also testified before Congress on the need for improved pension fund transparency. Thanks to his work, Congress is currently considering new legislation that would set federal standards for how states disclose pension obligations. MI is also doing path-breaking work on health care, education, energy, and tort reform. And with the help and encouragement of longtime supporter Marilyn Fedak, we have launched an ambitious new product, the project, the Adam Smith Society, a new organization on business school campuses dedicated to engaging students on the deeper significance of entrepreneurship and its centrality in, an, in sustaining our nation's proud, decent way of life. Think of it as the antithesis of, and even as one of the antidotes to, Occupy Wall Street and the broader anti-free market sentiments that Occupy Wall Street represents. <laughs> All of our work these days is done with one goal in mind, getting this country back on track and reigniting the great American growth machine. Indeed, our flagship City Journal has just published a special issue that should be arriving in your mailboxes this week devoted solely to the topic, Rebuilding the American Economy. I hope you will read it with care. The, st uh, the stakes at this moment of our history are enormously high, and the work of the Manhattan Institute has never been more urgent and necessary. Let me now turn to this evening's wrist and lecturer, the incomparable public intellectual, Neil Ferguson. Neil is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of History at Harvard University. He's also a senior fellow with the Hoover Institution and a senior research fellow at Oxford University. He's published 12 books, which have uh, won numerous awards. In, in 2008, he released The Ascent of Money, in which he recounts the world's long history of booms and busts, but also reminds the reader that, quote, poverty is not the result of rapacious financiers exploiting the poor. It has much more to do with the lack of financial institutions, with the absence of banks, not their presence, close quote. The PBS series that accompanied the book won the International Emmy Award for Best Documentary. His latest, Civilization, the West and the Rest, has just been released to wide acclaim. A reviewer for the Sunday Times of London writes, quote, Civilization is another masterpiece. A pulsing energy suffuses Ferguson's account and fascinating facts burst like fireworks on every page, close quote. As if that is not enough, Neil's film company has just released its first feature-length documentary about Henry Kissinger, whose biography he's currently writing. Neil is also a ubiquitous and sometimes refreshingly pugnacious commentator on contemporary politics and economics. Just the other day, he went mano a mano with Jeffrey Sachs on CNN, which became a must-see YouTube instant classic. Over the past year, he's been a strong critic of Paul Krugman's hyper-Keynesian and hyperventilating economic rants. Neil recently used a highly technical economic term to, des to describe Professor Krugman's views. He called them nuts. <laughs> the rest of us call Neil Ferguson an intellectual treasure. I'm delighted that we are graced by his presence this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, for that 
wonderful introduction. It's a huge pleasure to be with you here uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be involved with the Manhattan Institute. And it's a special pleasure uh, to be invited to give the Walter Wriston Lecture. Paul didn't mention it, uh, but Walter Wriston was the son of an historian. His father was, among other things, a president of Brown. He also didn't mention that Walter twice turned down the post of US Treasury Secretary. And in, thirdly, Paul omitted to mention Walter Riston's most enduring contribution to financial history, which was his observation that countries never go bankrupt. <laughs> For some reason, these words came back to me this week. <laughs> I've been discussing with my publisher, Penguin, and my agent, Andrew Wiley, how we could best publicize my new book. We had considerable success with our strategy for promoting the ascent of money. My idea was that we should get an investment bank to go bankrupt <laughs> shortly before its publication <laughs> in the belief that this would draw attention to a work of financial history. And that works very well, though I suppose there were some downside risks to that, that idea. So when I was asked what we should do this time around, I thought at the time it seemed rather fanciful. This is a book about the potential collapse of Western civilization. Why don't we have simultaneous governmental crises in Athens and in Rome? the cradles, after all, of Western civilization. At first, my friends at Penguin were skeptical. We'll never manage to pull that off, Neil. I said, you leave it to Silvio Berlusconi. <laughs> In truth, ladies and gentlemen, the question that I want uh, to address tonight goes beyond the question of whether or not countries can go bankrupt. Of course they can. I want to ask a, a larger question. And that question is whether a civilization can go bankrupt. Not just in the technical, fiscal sense of becoming insolvent, being unable to fund its liabilities, but in a more profound sense that has to do with culture, with values. In order to answer that question, I need to take you back in time. Because at the heart of, of my new book is a question which has long intrigued me, which I regard as in many ways the hardest question that can be asked about modern history. Why was it that after around 1500, uninterruptedly for the next 500 years, one civilization, the civilization that we call Western, meaning that it arose in the west of Eurasia, in Europe, and spread westwards across the Atlantic, why that one civilization became so much wealthier, healthier, and more powerful than all the other civilizations in the world. Let me try to illustrate what I mean by that proposition. In 1500, there was little to choose in terms of living standards between the West and the rest. Indeed, if you had gone on a world tour in that year, you would have been far more impressed by the great civilizations of the Orient than you would have been impressed by the rather smelly little towns of Western Europe. It was Ming China that seemed like the civilization set for world dominance, or 
the Ottoman Empire, the great empire of Islam that had conquered Constantinople just half a century before. You would not, I think, have predicted at that time that the nasty, petty, warring little states of Europe would ultimately take over the world and either conquer or subjugate those other civilizations, those other great empires. And yet they did. In 1500, the average Chinese was in fact richer than the average inhabitant of North America. By the late 1970s, the difference in income in per capita gross domestic product was so great that the average American was at least 20 times richer than the average Chinese. And if you calculate the differential in current dollar terms, making no adjustment for the fact that a haircut, for example, is much cheaper in China than it, than it is in New York, the difference was 70-fold. It wasn't just, however, that the West got richer than the rest. By the first half of the 20th century, the average Westerner's expectation of life at birth was double that of the average Resterner, the average inhabitant of the rest of the world. And perhaps most impressively of all, a dozen Western empires by the mid 20th century had established an, an extraordinary dominance in geopolitical terms over the rest of the world. Let me be precise. By 1913, 12 Western empires, one of them the United States, controlled 58% of the world's land surface, about the same proportion of its population, and 75%, three quarters, of the entire global economy. This was what economic historians have called the great divergence. And it is the single biggest story of modern history. How can we explain it? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, my view is that we cannot understand our present predicament. We cannot hope to understand our own problems today if we do not first understand the foundations of the West's past success. And that is what my book sets out to do. In order to retain the attention of my teenage children, which is always a challenge, as parents of teenagers will know, I did not answer the question as follows. There were six complexes of ideas and institutions which established Western dominance. It's that word institutions which seems to cause teenagers to glaze over. I don't know why. So what I said instead was there were six killer applications. And as they looked momentarily interested, I said, look at your phones, which they were doing anyway. <laughs> Notice those icons, the apps that you use. Well, it was a little bit as if Europe developed six killer apps that no other civilization had. And although it sounds like a rather crass way of getting the attention of teenagers, actually the analogy is not bad. Because the icons on your phone are very simple to look at, do wonderful things, but if you only knew the computer code behind them, they're actually terribly complicated. And the things that I'm about to say to you may sound simplified because, after all, I don't want to bore you, but each of the ideas and institutions that I'm going to describe is in fact quite intricate, as complex as the computer code behind the icons on your phone. So what were the six killer apps that made the West so powerful? The first, I would argue, is competition. Notice, I'm not going to use the word capitalism because that word is just a term of abuse, like imperialism, developed by the left in order to discredit something good. Let's talk instead about competition. <laughs> 
what distinguished the western end of Eurasia from the eastern end was not geography particularly or climate particularly or traditional culture particularly. It was that there was a profound institutional difference. At one end, at the eastern end, a monolithic empire, centuries old, ruled from the center with a homogenous bureaucracy recruited with an astonishingly rigid system of examination. At the western end, fragmentation, multiple countries, in 1,500, more than 100 of them. And within these countries, competition, economic competition. Since the 12th century, the merchants of London had been self-governing. They had a corporation, the ancestor of our modern corporations today. And even within that corporation, there was competition between the different livery companies representing the different arts and crafts. I argue in civilization that it was the competition within the West that propelled not only exploration, but also the exploitation of commercial opportunities that the Chinese let slip. In the early 1400s, China led the world in all kinds of respects, including oceanic navigation. They had bigger and better ships than the Portuguese or the Spaniards. In fact, Admiral Zhang He's treasure fleet sailed right the way across the Indian Ocean from China to the east coast of Africa. But after the death of the Yongle Emperor, his successor prohibited all oceanic navigation. The ships were destroyed, and even the plans to make the ships were burned. Nobody had that kind of power in Europe. Not the Holy Roman Emperor. He couldn't tell the Portuguese, stop seeking an alternative route to the Spice Islands. In Europe, the competition for trade routes was what propelled an age of discovery and an age of globalization, which began a profound transformation of the world. And it would not have happened if the states of the Atlantic seaboard had not been in a ferocious, and it often was ferocious, competition with one another. The second of my killer apps is science. Now, of course, there had been science in the non-Western world. Indeed, the Islamic world had led Europe in the 10th and 11th century. The Chinese had all kinds of technological innovations before the West did. But the scientific revolution that happened in the 17th century that we associate with men like Isaac Newton, fundamentally transformed our understanding of the natural world in an entirely new way and introduced scientific method of experimentation, iterated experimentation, and the publication of all new findings, transforming the nature of science itself. And this phenomenon was exclusively Western. The Muslim world played no part in it whatsoever, despite the proximity of Istanbul to the great centers of innovation in Europe. My third killer app was not democracy, because democracy came late to the West. It was the rule of law. How many lawyers are here tonight? Oh, be honest. Don't be ashamed. It's not like being a banker. <laughs> the rule of law evolved in the English-speaking world in an extraordinary and unique way, quite differently from the way that it evolved elsewhere. In particular, that the idea of private property rights as sacrosanct, as something the law existed to protect from arbitrary interventions by the sovereign, took root more strongly in England than anywhere else. When the English thought about the significance of their system of law. They appreciated that the representation of property rights in the legislative process was essential. And this was one reason why Parliament took on an extraordinary significance in English political life. It was out of the rule of law, out of the common law, that the power of a representative body evolved. Now, when John Locke argued that there was a link between property rights and freedom, it had a very different meaning in England from what it had in a new world where Englishmen and Scotsmen settled. 
In England, property was unequally distributed. It was overwhelmingly concentrated in the hands of a hereditary aristocracy. But when the British came to North America, they applied a remarkable principle. Please answer that phone. <laughs> if it's the president, we're busy. <laughs> they applied an extraordinary principle, which was that land should be distributed even to those who arrived with nothing. If, like Abraham Smith or Millicent Howe, who arrived in Charleston in 1670, penniless, as indentured laborers, you worked your way through five or seven years of hard work. At the end of it, you got 100 acres, 100 acres of virgin land. And with that 100 acres, if you were a man, you got the vote. No such institutional evolution happened in Latin America, where property was concentrated in the hands of the conquistadors and their descendants, and remained and remains extraordinarily unequally distributed to this day. The rule of law, particularly as it evolved in North America, was a killer app. And we should not make the mistake of thinking that holding elections with universal suffrage was the killer app. There are many countries where elections do happen today where there is no rule of law. Have you been to Venezuela lately? <laughs> oh, they hold elections there. I watched a man gunned down in the streets of Caracas when I was researching civilization. It was explained to me by one of the locals that he'd been shot by the police. I said, well, that's probably better on balance, I suppose, than if he was a policeman who'd been shot by a criminal. The Venezuelan looked at me and he said, Senor, in Venezuela, the police are just another gang. <laughs> and that is the absence of the rule of law, in essence. There are three other killer apps I want to mention briefly. One was modern medicine. I don't know if there are any doctors here tonight. But medical science from the late 19th century transformed human life expectancy, doubled it, more than doubled it. And this was a great breakthrough that was almost uniquely Western. The consumer society was the fifth killer app. Put your hand up if you have bought or had bought for you an article of clothing in the last two months. <laughs> Be honest. The consumer society. Based on our almost infinitely elastic appetite for clothing. Why is this a killer app? Because, ladies and gentlemen, there is no point having an industrial revolution if you do not first have a consumer society. The industrial revolution essentially reduces the unit price of an item of cotton clothing by 95%. Why would you bother doing that if there wasn't an infinitely elastic appetite for cotton clothing? There was. And hence the great economic divergence. Finally, the work ethic. Put your hand up if you got up before 6 a.m. this morning. <laughs> ah. That's why you were nodding off during my speech. <laughs> the work ethic Max Weber identified wrongly as peculiarly Protestant, but he was right that something had changed in the way that people worked in the West. What he got wrong was that it could equally well uh, be a Jewish work ethic. But work, longer hours, more intensively, aiming to raise your productivity. This was a killer app. So these six things, ladies and gentlemen, were what transformed the West and gave it the edge over the rest. What does this imply? Well, it implies two things. Firstly, it helps us to understand why Western predominance is ending on our watch. And it is. Remember that in 1978, the average American was 20 times richer than the average Chinese. Today, it's less than five times. That's in a lifetime, half a lifetime. The International Monetary Fund says that China's economy will be larger than that of the United States in 2016, in five years' time. In all kinds of ways, Western predominance is ending with astonishing speed, so fast that I think most people in the West are in denial about it, would rather not acknowledge it. 
But we shouldn't be surprised, because what has happened in the last 30 years is that the rest have downloaded our killer apps. They were, after all, open source. The Japanese were the first non-Western society to realize you could copy this stuff, and it worked. It came a long time later to China and even later to India. But the story of our generation is in part the story of an extraordinary Eastern, and not only Eastern, also Southern catch-up, based essentially on copying institutions that worked for us for roughly 500 years. But that is not the most important thing that is happening in our time. The other thing that has happened in the same period is that we seem to have been intent on deleting the killer apps on our own operating system. Take a look at those six things that I've listed one more time and ask yourself, how are we doing, really? How does the West compare with itself in its heyday? Take competition, for example. I think we all tend to assume that this is the most competitive economy in the world still. But if you look at the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index, it isn't. In fact, the US score in that index has declined sharply since the methodology was changed by the Davos folks uh, just seven years ago, whereas China's competitiveness score has risen by more than any other country. So, at least by that measure, we should not be complacent. How about science? Well, it's true that the Nobel Prizes still tend to go to researchers who are based or were born in the United States. But let's face it, they're old guys. What about the next generation? How will they fare at science? Well, let me share a statistic with you that never fails to startle me. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development does a thing called the PISA study, which compares in a standardized way how 15-year-olds do at science and at math. And what they discovered when they took in non-OECD countries to the survey was that the gap between 15-year-olds in Shanghai and 15-year-olds in the United States is as big as the gap between American teenagers and teenagers in Albania and in Tunisia. We cannot be confident that the future will somehow be designed by Apple in California and merely assembled in China. In a whole range of ways, an extraordinary catch-up is happening in education, and as a result of that catch-up in innovation, measured in terms of quantity by the number of patents registered every year, and qualitatively by the number of scientific publications cited. By both these measures, the East has already overtaken us, at least by the first, and by the second is catching up fast. What about medicine? Well, we certainly lead the world when it comes to spending money on healthcare. As a percentage of GDP, we spend twice what the Japanese spend and three times what the Chinese spend. But are the outcomes twice and three times better? I think it would be a struggle to claim that they are. What of the consumer society? Did you know that only three of the largest 30 shopping malls in the world are in the United States and nearly all the others are in the emerging markets? Our consumer society was doing just fine until we hit a wall of debt. Today, our consum consumption-driven economic model looks fundamentally broken because for 10 years or more we propelled it with increased leverage. Consumer society, too, seems to have moved east. And finally, there's the work ethic. Even by this measure, it seems to me the gap has dramatically narrowed. The Germans like to lecture other Europeans about their work ethic, but did you know that the average South Korean works a 1,000 hours more a year than the average German? And that's why when you go on vacation, there already are Germans there. <laughs> and when you leave, they don't leave. 
Let me bring you back, ladies and gentlemen, to the, my version of the Walter Riston question. Can a civilization go bust? Can a civilization go culturally, morally bankrupt as well, potentially, as fiscally? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is that if we lose sight of the ideas and institutions that propelled the West to greatness, we stand a good chance of replicating the experience of China at Adam Smith's day. Adam Smith, one of Scotland's great intellectuals, possibly the greatest ever to come from my home country, published a book in 1776. It was the most important thing to happen that year. <laughs> Entitled The Wealth of Nations. If you haven't re read it, you must. And in it, Smith says something very interesting about China, which has relevance to us today. He says, could it be that China has reached the maximum level of opulence, of wealth, consistent with its laws and institutions? He talks about China being in the stationary state. And he says, if they had different laws and institutions, of course, they might do much better. And that's absolutely right. That turns out to be completely correct. Smith understood better than almost any 18th century thinker how laws and institutions are the key to economic success. I worry, particularly when I look at Europe, but also when I look at the United States, that we might unwittingly be stumbling towards that stationary state. That we have allowed our laws and institutions no longer to be an incentive to create, but rather to be a drag on our creativity. We had the rule of law once. Now we have the rule of lawyers. Now we have a system of such complex regulation that to be an entrepreneur is by definition to be burdened by the need to take endless and highly expensive legal advice. The rule of law was once a killer app, but when I look at the way in which law and regulation are manufactured in this country today, when I plow my way through the Dodd-Frank Act, I wonder what Adam Smith would have said about that. The good news is that I believe the bankruptcy of civilization is avoidable. I'm not one of those declinists who peddles inevitable fall. On the contrary. The lesson of history is that things can be turned around through institutional reform if you recognize the problem. If you recognize that we no longer have the most competitive economic structures, that all kinds of barriers to entry exist, not least in a financial services sector dominated by too big to fail institutions. If you recognize that we no longer have a sufficiently good public school system to generate the next generation of innovators, if you recognize that the rule of law is no longer as good here as it is, at least from an entrepreneur's perspective, in Hong Kong. And by the way, that is what the World Economic Forum says. On 15 out of 16 measures of the efficiency of the rule of law, Hong Kong beats the United States hands down. We have to recognize that in medical science, we may lead in some respects, but in public health, we lag woefully behind. And we've somehow managed to reform our healthcare system in a way that seems to make it worse. We have to recognize that our consumer society has in many ways become dysfunctional, over-reliant on debt. And finally, we have to ask ourselves what work ethic there can be when as a result of economic policy mismanagement, we condemn an ever-rising proportion of our population to indolence, to an unemployment that may not be voluntary, to an unwanted leisure. In the past, I've commented often on the fiscal problems that this country faces. And I remain profoundly concerned that the drama that plays out in Italy today could one day play out in the United States.
that a public financial policy that implies that by 2050, if nothing is changed, all federal tax revenues will be consumed by interest payments on the federal debt is not a policy that can be tolerated for a single day more. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, my message tonight is broader in its scope. It is not only our fiscal institutions that are ailing. In other respects, our civilization desperately needs us to delete the viruses, to update what were once our killer apps, and then, not only politically but morally, to reboot our whole machine. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have time for some questions. Uh, there's three mics scattered around the room, so if you just wait for me to acknowledge you, you will have a microphone moved towards you. So just raise your hand and tell us who you are. Any questions? Uh, Chuck? Chuck Bruni in the back. Just wait for the microphone, Chuck. About a year and a half ago, you spoke at Mount Parliament Society, and you had an incredibly uh, sound uh, thing to the economists in the audience that all of you have missed, all of you missed the uh, financial breakdown because you didn't have enough knowledge of history. Is there anything that you have seen in the last two years, year and a half, that has changed that view? I suppose I am a passionate believer that historical knowledge is indispensable. It's not optional. It's the thing we should want our best students to study. It's the thing we should want them to major in. And I, I am an advocate of historical knowledge as a tool of understanding. And you're right, sir, one of the most profound and to my mind upsetting causes of the financial crisis was the ignorance of financial history of key decision makers in both the public and the private sector. I used routinely to ask audiences in the financial services sector, who here has read Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, the single most important book of financial history about this country? And in an audience this size of bankers or hedge fund managers, or for that matter, regulators, typically one in a hundred people had read the book. It has not improved. These days I ask about another book, Anybody trying to understand the international financial crisis of today should really have read Barry Eichengreen's wonderful book, Golden Fetters, which is the best international history of the Great Depression. If you want to understand what is happening in Europe right now, you need to see the way in which once in the past, a whole group of countries constrained themselves by a monetary straitjacket that had the effect of amplifying and worsening their problems. The last time I asked a group of financial experts who had read Eichengreen's Golden Fetters? None had. So we have a problem in the way that we educate ourselves, our leaders, the people that run our, our banks, the people who are representing us in Congress. We don't teach them enough history. And that is something we can change. It illustrates my point that our problems are fixable. There's no predestined decline that lies ahead of us. We must simply change the incentive structure change the knowledge base, and make people realize that the models, much vaunted models of macroeconomics, were next to worthless in anticipating the financial crisis. But the historical knowledge offered a real key, and I believe it still does. Uh, Carl Icahn? Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, have, have one comment or question. Yeah. You know, it's it's easy to, uh, to to criticize what we're doing in our Western culture, and I agree with you. And I'm certainly very much against the Democratic Party and what 
is going on, so I'm certainly not here to defend it. But I think you have to go easy and you have to be in between because our economy, and I'd like you to comment on this. I mean, you say we have to, at this moment in time, uh, uh, stop the interest payments and I, uh, on, the f on the federal <coughs> debt. But I tell you, if you stop that, if you stop that, it's, it's like giving a, like bringing in a morphine addict, you know, and the guy had a bad heart attack, and you bring him in, in the, os the hospital, and the guy is, uh, has to have morphine in order to give the operation, and you say, well, we can't give him morphine because he's a morphine addict, so he dies. So if you go in here and you stop spending money right now in this economy, our economy's in terrible shape. Western Europe is on the brink of disaster, as you say, Hopefully they can pull it back, but it's it's much worse than people think. I I believe because if you ever have a run on a sovereign debt, if you ever have a run on a sovereign debt, the whole thing is over over there. I mean, there's just nothing. Nobody can put up a trillion dollars to save that, and you're almost there already. And that happened in this country. So if you say now at this point we can't spend money in this country and we can't, and we have to suddenly shut it off and stop spending spending the interest, I ask you. What do you do with the, with, the, with the great problems that we have, you know, with the unemployment? And that unemployment is 17, 18%, not 7%. So I wonder if you don't go in between and you don't do it carefully. And also, I'll say one more thing. We talk about regulation, and you say, well, you can't have Dodd-Frank. But, but, you know, uh, uh, human nature in Wall Street is what it is. I mean, you get the, these bright guys. I mean, it's like telling a pit bull, and you put a piece of steak in front of a pit bull, and you say, don't eat it. And, 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 and that's what Goldman Sachs did. You put the, the, the stake in front of them and say, hey, don't touch it. And now you say, what well, you can't have regulation because if you have regulation, uh, you know, it's bad. So what are we going to have? We're going to have Wall Street do it again. I mean, Wall Street was greedy, but hell, nobody regulated them. So, you, you know, I just ask you, it's not as black and white as you're making, in my opinion, although, although, uh, you, you're sort of right on in the long run. I agree. We're in real, <laughs> we're, we're in, we're in real trouble. <laughs> but I'd like you to comment on those couple of things. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's very important that we should recognize that there are a couple of fairy stories out there about our predicament. One is this whole financial crisis was caused by deregulation. Therefore, the answer is regulation. And the other fairy story is anybody who recommends measures to stabilize the public finances of the United States is a proponent of austerity who wants to drive the economy into a deeper depression. Let me take the second one where you began, sir. At no point in my protracted and highly unpleasant argument with Paul Krugman have I said that tomorrow we should raise taxes and slash spending although he's frequently tried to suggest that that's my position. From the outset, I said that any attempt at stimulus would be undermined if there were no medium-term credible plan to return the United States to fiscal balance. What has been characteristic of this administration is that it has never attempted to arrive at anything resembling a credible plan to restore the finances of this country to balance. Indeed, the Congressional... <laughs> the last time the Congressional Budget Office tried to project fiscal policy on the basis of current policy, what it showed was that the United States would never again this century run a balanced budget, that it would run a deficit every year until the projections peter out in the 2080s. Now, my position is that that is a recipe for an Italian-style crisis at some point. One can't say when. We never know when the bond market will suddenly lose faith. But when it does, you do not want to be around. You don't want that death spiral to happen here. A year ago, no one said it would happen to Italy. A year ago, no one said it could happen to Spain. A year ago, oh, it was just a Greek problem. And the big fairy story is that somehow the United States is special and the laws of fiscal arithmetic don't apply. And we can run a trillion dollar deficit every year for the rest of time. No. That is not the lesson of history. The lesson of history is that that policy leads to national ruin. As for the second fairy story, that this whole financial crisis was caused by deregulation beginning with the evil Ronald Reagan and so on and so forth, this is nonsense. As I tried to show in the ascent of money, the causes of the crisis are complex. 
They do not exclusively lie in the behavior of deregulated or unregulated financial entities. On the contrary, it was the most regulated entities that were the epicenter of the crisis, the Fannie Mae, the Freddie Mac, not the hedge funds, but the most regulated entities, the commercial banks. <laughs> How much longer do we have to hear this propaganda? The causes of the crisis were relatively proximate. An error of monetary policy by the Federal Reserve between 2002 and 2004. Errors by the rating agencies. 64,000 structured financial products with a triple A rating. And above all, errors by Congress. A fundamental error in the way the US mortgage market was rigged in order to encourage families who couldn't possibly afford to own their own homes to take out mortgages. It was the regulations, not the deregulations, that caused the crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, I passionately believe that what Karl Krauss said about psychoanalysis applies to regulation, that it is the disease of which it pretends to be the cure. <laughs> the more complex the regulation, the more hundreds of pages of verbiage pour out of our Congress, the more the ordinary businessman, the meat eater on Wall Street, ceases to ask the question, am I doing the right thing? And merely asks, are we compliant? <laughs> Compliance, that's a terrible word that's taken place, taken the place of judgment in our system and created precisely that dysfunctional rule of lawyers that I talked about earlier. It's not that I disrespect the legal profession, but we need to recognize when a system becomes a dysfunctional cost that is essentially parasitic on entrepreneurs and wealth creators. Thank you. We have a question in the far right corner. Hi, I have a question regarding a, a killer app that you didn't mention. Um, both the East and the West have families, and uh, how would you compare what the East has done? Have they preserved the family better than the West, and is that a killer app for them these days? One of the challenges of writing comparative global history is trying to decide the things that mattered and the things that didn't. And it seems as if changes in the nature of the family and differences in the nature of the family can't really have been all that significant. Why? Because there was dramatic change in the nature of the family in both the West and the East over the time period that I'm discussing. In my grandfather's generation, in Scotland, it was common to have eight or nine siblings and to be part of something that was more or less a clan, which would have its clan gathering and woe betide you if you met the clan after they'd gathered. <laughs> All of that has gone. In the space of an amazingly short time, we cease to have multiple brothers. When those wonderful words in the Ode to Joy Alle Menschen werden Brüder, were penned by Schiller. Many, many people had many brothers in the East and the West. The advent of the nuclear family, of the, of the tiny and sometimes explosive family, is a very recent phenomenon, and it's occurred in both the West and the East. However, in one part of the East, a peculiar and state-driven policy, the one-child policy in China, has created a singular ticking demographic time bomb that is worth alluding to. I don't want you to walk away this evening thinking that I believe it's a slam dunk that China takes over the world, because I don't believe that. Indeed, I think China has more profound demographic and political problems ahead of it in the next 20 years than almost any other Asian society. And one of them, is unquestionably a consequence of the centralized control uh, of reproductive rights through the 80s and 90s. Don't get the idea, in, the, in short, that it's going to be a Chinese century. The rest generally are catching up with us. That's clear. But one of the most obvious players in this contest has, in the form of the one-child policy, a massive handicap that will kick in over the next 20 years. Thanks. One final question in the back, and then we'll adjourn. Uh, hi, I'm George Priest. Actually, I'm a friend of your, my wife and I are friends of your wife. <laughs>
She's much more interesting. I'm sorry she's not here, but I'm sorry we too because she's dearly. much more glamorous too. She is. She is. Now you're pretty good, but she's uh, she is more glamorous. But uh, I want to ask this question. Uh, I I've read many of your earlier books. I haven't read Civilization. I'm sorry for that. But your argument tonight, and it seems that the argument in Civilization is largely comparative. And you've just made in your last comments the Chinese are catching up, the Indians are catching up, the rest of the world is is uh, catching up. And my question is, what's wrong with that? That is, in terms of the wealth of the world, why isn't it a good thing that the Chinese are becoming more productive, the Indians are becoming more productive, they, they're stealing our apps, they have better, uh, maybe they have better investment in, uh, be better uh, achievement in science and math, but in terms of the, of the total wealth of the world, why isn't that a good thing? It may be that the U.S. becomes the second largest or third largest economy. It, well, they have, you know, they have three times more people than we do. And, but but what in, ter in terms of the overall wealth of the world and the betterment of uh, human standards of living, why isn't that a good thing? This is a, a great question. And I don't want you to get the idea that, that I'm anything other than delighted that between 300 and 600 million Chinese have been pulled out of poverty in the last 30 or so years. It's a cause for celebration that that dismal and failed model, the planned economy, has finally been discredited in nearly every country uh, in the world. However, there are two things that we need to recognize. The first is that if the rest of the world were to start using natural resources at just half the lifetime rate of the average American, just half, we would very rapidly run out of a whole series of natural resources, including some quite common things. Copper, for example, would be exhausted within 30 years in that scenario. We can't pretend that if the rest of the world achieves even half our standard of living, there won't be problems. Even if you are the most hardened skeptic on climate change, you should be concerned about the physical supply of commodities as we see this extraordinary Asian economic miracle proceed. So that's the first part of my answer. The second part of my answer is that power matters, and only those who have it only those who have been living in the dominant power in the world should be so deluded as to think losing it would be okay. <laughs> Take it from me, and this will be my final remark because I don't want to come between you and the rest of your evening. Take it from me, speaking with what Stephen Colbert described the other night as my speech impediment my British accent, <laughs> decline, ceasing to be number one, is not fun. And we got off lightly because we declined relative to you. And as I explained to Mr. Colbert, we essentially invented you, so it's really not so bad. <laughs> but when, when China, as will happen, uh, becomes the largest economy in the world. That will have major implications in a whole range of different ways because China is not a free society. It is a one-party state in which the freedom of expression is heavily circumscribed, in which an artist can be arrested at an airport, indefinitely detained, and have his studio demolished because he dares to question the authority of the Communist Party. A world in which that is the biggest economy was never something we had to fear during the Cold War because the Soviet Union never got close in economic terms. China is so close that the moment it overtakes is five years away. And that has profound implications. Yes, I know they only have one aircraft carrier and it's a sort of second-hand Ukrainian one. Ha ha. <laughs> but you know, the war is never fought in the dimension you expect, the dimension of the last war. The next war won't be fought on the oceans. It will be fought in cyberspace. And in cyberspace, there is no gap between the United States and China. As anyone 
who is an expert in this field will tell you. There, our complex civilization, with its perhaps excessive reliance on electronic communication, and indeed on electricity, is far, far more vulnerable than I think most of us realize. And that is why I've written this book. Not because I in any way savor the prospect of an American collapse of Western disaster. On the contrary, I passionately want us to avert that. I want us to avert the nightmare scenario of the kind of world in which we would find freedom circumscribed by a more powerful and culturally, civilizationally, profoundly different power. I believe we'll only avert that if we learn from history, remember what our strengths are, and regain them through the urgent, urgent institutional reform that I believe in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.